some of you have probably been wondering when it is that God had predestinated us, predestinated us to discuss Calvinism again, and tonight is that night that he's predestinated us to, uh, to talk about Calvinism. But before we do that, we will turn to, or get, uh, we're going to do uh, Philippians chapter number two. And so, I don't know, let's all stand up together. Why don't we do that? Do that. All right. What's that? Am I looking? Nope. I need, I need sunglasses on or something. So, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, my wife is staring at me to see if I'm looking down at my computer. I, I'm going to have to look down at my computer some. So, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any f fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, esteem other better than themselves. Look not everything on his own things, but also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, as not pr presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that is a son with the Father. He is served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Right. Okay. So, if it's predestinated that you know we talk about Calvinism tonight, uh, what is Calvinism? Not everybody knows what Calvinism is, and to gain insight into that, it would probably help to look at uh, uh, one of the basic foundations of faith for the Calvinistic people, and you can find that in the Westminster Westminster Confession of Faith in 1646. So, listen to this. God, from all eternity, did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. So that's why we're talking about Calvinism tonight, because everything, whatsoever comes to pass, has been preordained of God. So, basically, 
What Calvinism is, is the philosophy of fatalism morphed into a religion. And more specifically, it's the philosophy of fatalism pushed into the scriptures, pushed into the Bible. That's really what that is. Um, in Calvinism, God has preordained some people to hell while he's preordained some people to be saved and be in heaven. That's a result of that fatalism and everything preordained and done. Several hundred years ago, the Dutch people were for the most part reformed. They were Calvinists. But there was a group that pushed back against some of the teachings of Calvinism. And so they said, you know, we have some, we have some problems with your teaching with, and with your, you know, with your doctrines. And so as a result of that challenge to uh, Calvinist theology, Calvinists got together and they had five main points that they said would explain their doctrine. And they're known by uh, the acronym TULIP. TULIP stands for total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So based on all the, those, are, those are the underlying foundations, if you will, of, of their, their main doctrine about how God operates. And tonight, I think what the blessing will be is not so much that we're gonna see that Calvinism is wrong, although it definitely is. But what the real blessing is, is when we look at the true nature of God and how God operates in our world and what he does in order to save sinners. Because there is a, there is, I mean, there, Calvinism and biblical Christianity are at opposite, opposite ends of the spectrum right. on, how, on how God saves souls. Right. So uh, let's, let's deal with that tonight. Let's look at that. So the first thing, uh, their, their, their first doctrine, the first thing they use to buttress uh, their beliefs when they had to respond to the challenges uh, is total depravity. And so, are men totally depraved? Well, it kind of depends on the definition of the term, doesn't it? Right. If, you de if you defined it biblically, um, then that's one thing. If, for instance, if total depravity means man's heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, I, I'm, in, I'm in agreement. If we were to say, if we were to go further and say, men are shapen in iniquity and conceived in, their mothers conceived them in sin, I go with that because that matches the Bible. <clears throat> but Calvinism goes much further than that. In Calvinism, total depravity means that all people, when they're born physically, they are, spiritually speaking, they are still born. They're still born when you're born physically. You have no spiritual life from the outset. As a result of being spiritually dead, no one can have faith. No one can hear God. No one can seek God. No one can turn to God. No man can believe God. And no one can receive God. In order for a man to do any of those things, God first has to regenerate that individual. He's dead in his trespasses and sins. He has no heart toward God whatsoever. He's just like all other lost sinners. But because of no explained reason, God has decided to choose certain individuals and just regenerate them with no desire on their part whatsoever. <clears throat> so, now, Rem we'll remember some of the basics, which, you know, which are just good Bible truths and a blessing. You know, in 1 John 9, we know Jesus Christ is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Romans chapter 12, we find out that God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. That leads us to Romans chapter 1. Get Romans chapter 1, if you will. Now, we certainly believe that men are spiritually dead as a result of their sin, but God gives us the process and how that occurs, and we're going to look at that tonight. But even though they're spiritually dead, 
God gives them a lot of spiritual, spiritual truth. And you see that in Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness in the men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So right there, they've got truth and they hold it. They're unrighteous, but they have the truth and they hold it. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. So what's known of God is in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So they have an understanding, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they were out without excuse. Now that explains why they're without excuse, doesn't it? Because of all the things that they've been shown, all the things that innate, that's innate within them, that they have an understanding and that the power of God is shown, they have no excuse because God has given them that information. But then we continue on in verse number 21, because that when they knew God, they did know God. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. It got dark, the heart got darkened. It didn't start out utterly dark. It became darkened because of the truth that they didn't want to hold on to. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. All right, you're right there in Romans 1. Get Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 5, verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So we're going to find out sin is not imputed to bring spiritual death until an individual comes under the law. We're going to, we're going to see that in just a second when we look at Romans chapter 7. But even so, the wages of sin is still death. And people can die physically nonetheless. Now, I've, I've, I've had people in discussion forums ask this question, and Calvinists don't know how to answer them because they don't know if, if the child of that parent who just died, they don't know if they were elect or not. They don't know if God chose to save them before the foundation of the world or not. So they have no idea what to tell somebody who loses a child. But what this passage is telling us is that even though sin is not imputed spiritually and kills someone spiritually, sin still works to bring death in this world. And so you have infants that die, sudden death syndrome. You have toddlers that can die in a car accident. Or you could even have a 50-year-old man who, because he had measles when he was two years old and had tremendous fever and had damage to his brain, never came to the point of intellectual maturity when he could understand that there's a God and understand what sin is and understand what sinning against God is. You could have a 50-year-old who dies, who has never been under law, and he never died spiritually. Right. So now let's see that. Is what I told you right? Let's turn to Romans chapter 7 and we'll see it specifically mentioned. Romans chapter 7, verse number 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what's he saying there? He's not talking about his physical death. Paul was born. His mother gave birth to him. He's lived a physical life all up and through this point. So he's not talking about his physical life ending. He's saying, I had spiritual life at one point. But then I came under law. And then sin killed me. See, it's like sin is in us, but... The Bible says without the law, sin is dead. It can't do anything. It's in you, but it's dormant. It can have an effect on you physically like we just talked about with the infant that dies or, who, you know, in death. But until you come under the law, that sin inside you is dormant. It's dead. It's an inactive. But once you come to a point where you understand that God exists 
and your conscience tells you that you're sinning against God and you continue to sin, at that point, you die spiritually. So, the point that Calvinists say that people are still born spiritually shows they don't read the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. They don't, and this is true with all people who follow systems. They've already decided that the system is the final authority. They've, they've exercised their ability to choose. They've used their opinion, and they've decided that this particular system is true. And it doesn't matter what you do or show and tell them, if they won't let go of that, then you're not going to be able to help them because they'll say, well, the Bible, that's, you know, that was translated improperly, or you're not interpreting it properly, even though you're believing exactly what it says. They're going to come up with some excuse why my system is true, and it doesn't matter what anything else says. Now, the person, who, the person who's open to that and open to hear what you have to say you can help that person when you show them what the Bible says because they haven't made that decision yet. They might see and read things and hear people tell them things. And they might say, well, okay, I guess maybe that sounds good. That might be right. But they haven't shown. The Calvinists won't teach these verses. They're not going to teach you all the truth from the Bible. They're going into the scriptures and they're picking things out that appear to support their teachings. And that's all they're going to talk about. They're not going to get, the only way you can get them to ever discuss it is when you bring it out and say, hey, your, your, your belief is wrong, here's the Bible. And they're going to come up with some reason why they have to reject the clear truth of the Bible because of that choice they made that that that's what they believe and what is. Turn to James chapter 1, and we'll see this, we'll see this repeated right here. James chapter 1. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed that when lust, lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So what did Paul say? He was alive without the law, but then there was lust inside of him, and he was enticed by sin, and he did commit sin after that point when he was under law, and then sin killed him. So what we see in James chapter 1 meshes perfectly with Romans chapter 7, and what happens in, in the spiritual death of a person. <clears throat> the Bible says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. You didn't start out astray. You had to go astray. Everyone has turned. We have turned everyone to his own way. You didn't start out on your own way. You had to turn to start going your own way. God starts you out right. God, why? Because God created us for his good pleasure. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't want people in hell. God wants a relationship with each and every one of us. So, men turn away from God, but that's not God's fault. So, that begs the next question. Can men that are spiritually dead respond to God? Get John chapter 5. Please get Genesis chapter 2. John 5 and Genesis 2. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now, just in case there's any question about the order of things in verse number 24, Jesus says this in verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Jesus said, doesn't matter what Calvinists say, Jesus say, said, that dead people dead in their trespasses and sins can hear him. And if they hear, and like we said, like we see there in verse 24, if they believe, then they pass from death to life. God doesn't make them spiritually alive first 
and then they hear and then they believe. That's not the order that God uses. God says he can speak to dead men, they can hear him, they can believe him, and when they do, they pass from their current condition, which is spiritual death, into spiritual life, everlasting life, because God does speak to them, they can hear, they can believe, and that's how God operates. And you see this with the very first man and woman who ever existed. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, remember what we said? Lust entices you. Lust, conceived, brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, what does it do? It kills you. So she saw that, it was, and she lusted after it. And she did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were, uh, both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, Calvinists like to use Romans 3, 11, they like to say, there's none that seeketh after God. And that's absolutely true. And you see that here in the garden. When the voice of the Lord, the Word, made flesh, Jesus Christ was walking in the garden after they had eaten that fruit. What did they do? They went and they hid. They didn't seek after God. But praise the Lord, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's exactly what he's doing here. That's exactly what he's doing here in the garden. And they came to Jesus, and we know they did, because in verse number 21, unto Adam and, to, and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So we see the very, from the very first man and woman who ever existed, they sinned against God. They didn't seek after God. They, in fact, they hid from him. But you know what? When they heard the Lord's voice calling out to them, you know what they didn't hear? They didn't hear such unbelievable anger that they knew that there was destruction in his voice. Had they heard that, they would have, they would have run further away. It would make sense. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stay away from the Lord as long as I can because when he gets me, that's the end of me. But that's not what they heard in his voice because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God is a gracious God, and he's gracious to all. And they heard grace in his voice, and they came to him. And sure enough, God took away the coverings that they tried to make for themselves, and he provided covering, the covering of the lamb. Okay, so now let's just consider some verses that just reinforce this. John 10, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay, you believe and you receive before you become a son of God. Not after, not after you're reborn, not after you're regenerated. And one thing too, I always see that Calvinists like to use the word regenerate. They don't like to use born again for some reason, and I'm not sure quite what that is. They just don't seem to like it. But, you know, it's, um, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation online with a, with a fellow who was a Calvinist. And I said, you know, Calvinists believe you have to be born again to be born again. He said, we don't believe that. And I said, well, I know that's not what you mean when you say regenerated. You mean born again. But the Bible says you can't be born again until after you hear God, repent toward him, believe him, and receive him. Only at that point can you be born again. So you have man being born again, regenerated, before he can do all these things. But he has to do all those things before he's born again. So really, you're saying he has to be born again to be born again. So... That's really kind of what that's 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 really what it boils down to. But you know they would they would argue that. But 
That's the way the Bible says. Okay, John 20, 31. But these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Again, belief comes before life. Um, Acts 13, 39. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. There again, you have belief before justification. How about how to be saved? Acts 16, 30. The Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, be saved and thou shalt believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No, that's not what they said. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You got to believe. You want to be saved? You got to believe first. Amen. Then you'll be saved. Amen. So, Romans 4, 3. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And then down in verse number 20 for the same, uh, same chapter. But for, all, but for all souls also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead. So righteousness is imputed after belief, not before. So the Bible's clear. Those spiritually dead can hear, they can repent, they can believe, they can receive, and in fact they must do these things before they are saved, before they are regenerated. They have to do those things. Okay. Now, the next letter is U for unconditional election. Calvinistic election is the false belief that God in eternity past selected some men for salvation while the unselected would spend eternity in the lake of fire. And they put it, they, they put it this way. The doctrine of election means to that eternal act of God, whereby he in his sovereign good pleasure, on an account of no foreseen merit in them, chooses a certain number of men to, the, to be the recipients of special grace and of eternal salvation. In order to emphasize the fact that God's election or choice of certain sinners to be saved is not based upon anything that the sinner himself does, Reformed theologians refer to election to eternal life as unconditional election. So you're predetermined to be saved. But let's see what the Bible has to say about elect. Get uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and uh, get Deuteronomy. Well, get, we'll start with, uh, if you want to get a, a couple spots ahead, first we'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and we'll look at Deuteronomy 7 and Isaiah 45. So the first thing we see we'll look at is 1 Timothy 5.21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. So the Bible tells us that there are elect angels. We don't know much about what elect angels are, but the Bible does tell us that they are elect. And that becomes important when we consider other things, that there are elect angels. And in Deuteronomy 7, Isaiah 45, we find out that there are not only elect angels, but there's also one nation that is elect. Deuteronomy 7, 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So God has chosen a nation, a certain people, and he's made them to be a nation unto himself. Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness, the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord, which call thee by name. He says, he's, God says, I am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, that's Jacob the individual, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by name, I have surnamed thee, that thou hast not known me. So God tells Cyrus that he's using him, he's going to return Israel from captivity, and he talks about the nation of Israel being his elect. Now, that's important when you look at Mark chapter 30 and you're thinking about the great tribulation, 
The Bible says, and except the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake. That's talking about the nation of Israel, which has to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not talking about the church. It's talking about that elect nation. So we've seen that there are elect angels. There's an elect nation, the nation of Israel. But most importantly, though, most importantly, though, Jesus Christ is the elect. Isaiah 42 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Isaiah 42, 1 Peter chapter 2. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. That's obviously referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God's elect. He's the elect. 1 Peter 2, 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So, we have elect angels, we have the nation of Israel that's elect, and then we have Jesus Christ, who is the elect. And that's the most important elect of all. Now, what we find out as we look in the Bible is that individuals are only called elect once they are in Jesus Christ, who is the elect. Second John talks about the elect lady. Um, Corinthian, uh, Colossians chapter 3 speaks of all the church collectively, individually, but members of one body as the elect, put on therefore as the elect of God. That's speaking to the church made up of people who are elect because they are in Christ. Amen. So um, it, it speaks of that. Uh, now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, again, it's addressing people that are in the church, it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Aha! The Calvinist has something he can hang his hat on there because there's, there's something there that's foreknowledge. God knew what he was going to do, and he had all that up there. Well, that's not what God's talking about in the passage, and we'll find that further. The foreknowledge is he knows how he's going to save sinners. He's going to save them <clears throat> through sanctification of the Spirit, through, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what is foreknowledge, is that how God is going to save people, and those are going to be those in Christ. And you see that in Ephesians chapter number 1. So the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. When I have conversations with Calvinists, they always leave out the in him. And I thought, that, I thought that streak was going to come to an end a couple weeks ago because there was a, a message board going on and a discussion, and a fellow quoted this verse accurately. I said, oh, but he didn't say he was a Calvinist. So I said, yeah, I like that verse too. It doesn't support Calvinism, but I sure like the verse. And then he comes back and says, oh, yes, it does. And then he's talked about being chosen before the foundation of the world. When he was talking about what he believed, he leaves out the in him. So he doesn't really, they don't really understand that you have to be in Christ in, in, in order to be elect. You have to be in Christ in order to be saved. And what was, what was planned before the foundation of the world is not those who would be saved individually, but anyone who trusts Jesus Christ is going to be in Christ, and by virtue of being in Christ, then he's going to be saved. That's what was determined and decided uh, in eternity past. Because no one is in Christ from eternity past. You're in Christ. Well, remember what John the Baptist said? He said, I indeed, I indeed baptize with water, but there's one who comes after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And that's a future tense, by the way. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is the one that's going to do that. So what happens, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And when are you baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ? When you believe. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Through the operation of the Holy Spirit, the baptism that Jesus performs, you're placed into the body of Christ. You're not in the body of Christ until that baptism occurs. So you can't be in Christ until you trust him and you're saved. All right, 
limited atonement. Limited atonement. Limited atonement is the teaching that Christ did not die for all sinners, but only for the elect. Now, we already see some obvious problems with that because we looked at what the Bible has to say about elect. Jesus didn't die for angels. That's something that the angels desire to look into. To be saved, you have to be born of water. That's a physical birth. No angel had a physical birth. You have to be born of water and of the Spirit. So salvation is never offered to angels. So there are elect angels. They say, Calvinists say Jesus only died for the elect, so he, they must have died for angels. No, not according to the Bible, they didn't. The nation is elect. Israel. Jesus didn't die to save the nation of Israel. The Bible says he died that the people, he died for the people that the nation perish not. That's what Jesus did. He died for the people, not for the nation. By dying for the nation, I mean by dying for the people, that helps the nation. But he didn't die for a country. He died for the people. And then, of course, Jesus is the elect. Jesus didn't die to save himself. So Jesus, they, Jesus only died for the elect. They don't even know who the elect is, and it doesn't make any sense when you look at all the Bible has to say about it. So, the term limited atonement, it's not in much, as much in vogue as it used to be, and now they're saying you know, it has a negative connotation because it's limited, and so now they're talking about using things like definite atonement or particular redemption. But regardless of the word games, what they're really meaning is that Christ only died for the elect. So, the false logic is, if Christ died for all, then all must be saved. And the other side of the coin that they use is, unless you are a universalist, a universalist believes that everybody's saved regardless of what, because Christ died for all. They say, unless you're a universalist, you believe in limited atonement too because you know that some people end up in the lake of fire. So that's the argument and the logic they use, which is also false. And just to give you, just to give you an example of that, um, I see Chris back in there in the sound room. Now, I think everybody knows Chris Jones is a pretty generous kind of guy. He's a nice guy. And so Chris decides that he is going to buy all the members of BBC a dinner. And so, amen. So he calls up, he calls up Sonny's, and he says, I need to buy X number of dinners, because I want every member of BBC to have a barbecue dinner. And so he says, how much is it going to run? So they figure it out. They give him a number. Chris pulls out his credit card, pays for it, done deal. Everybody's dinner is paid for. So then Chris makes the announcement on such and such a date. Sonny's is bringing dinner for everybody. Does that mean everybody's going to eat a barbecue dinner? What if you don't like barbecue and you don't want the dinner? What if you don't like Chris Jones? Because you say, you know, Chris, I don't know that I like that guy. I don't want anything. I don't want what he has for me. Well, isn't that what people do with Jesus? Jesus said they hated me without a cause. There's some people who aren't interested in Jesus or anything he has to offer. And as a matter of fact, when Brother Bernard and I were at the, uh, uh, at the fireworks show, we had a particular fellow who was just vile as he could be, saying things about Jesus. He hated him without a cause. But anyway, regardless of whether anybody takes that dinner that Chris offers or not, he paid for it all. It's paid in full. The price is paid. The dinners are available. If people don't take it, he still paid the price. It's paid for. It's, limited. it's not limited because people don't take him up on the offer. That doesn't limit the payment at all. He still had to write a check at the end of the month for that same amount, regardless of whether anybody ate it or not. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Look forward to it. So, just more, a few more verses at face value. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not just the elect. For all. 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not just for the elect. Amen. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, but that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for 
every man. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially them that believe. He's the Savior of all men. He's paid for everyone's sins. But you have to believe in order to get advantage of what he bought and paid for. You know, it's just like a gift. If somebody offers you a gift that's bought and paid for, but you don't receive it, you don't get the benefit of ownership. Whatever that gift is and whatever it can do, if you don't take it, it doesn't do you any good. But it was still bought and paid for, and it was still offered. And that's what God's done for each and every one of us. And the Bible says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So it's all. It wasn't just the elect. It's all. And we've got even more verses, but we're going to go on. Irresistible grace. <clears throat> a doctrine crucial to understanding, this is their words, a doctrine crucial to understanding the biblical doctrine of salvation is irresistible grace. Irresistible grace means that men who are dead spiritually are regenerated and effectually called by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works immediately upon the soul, infusing a new spiritual life into it, thus changing it in such a way that it is spiritually alive and oriented toward Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit enables and persuades men to embrace Jesus Christ savingly. The reason it is called irresistible grace is that this special grace produces the effect intended by God, the salvation of particular individuals. This special grace has been called irresistible, effectual, invincible, unconquerable, unconquerable and certain. This doctrine logically proceeds from man's total depravity, God's unconditional election, and Christ's limited atonement. So what they just admitted is they built this system of theology on a faulty foundation and they try and connect these doctrines one another to help them prop up each other and, and, and let them stand. But the fact of the matter is when Bible truth comes to light, they all come crashing down. So <clears throat> the Bible says in Genesis 6, 8 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It wasn't forced on him. He found it. What does that imply? If you find something, that means you're looking for it. God, uh, Noah wanted grace from God. He wanted it, and he received it. It wasn't forced on him. Same thing, the Bible says the same thing in Exodus uh, 33, 12. Moses found grace in God's sight. It wasn't forced on him. And uh, regarding grace, Romans 5, 2 says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Faith gets you that grace. It's not that you are regenerated, you have to have faith that leads you into that grace, and that grace is what saves you and gives you eternal life. So uh, uh, the Bible's full of examples uh, that, that, that tell us that grace is not irresistible. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, so if, there, if grace is irresistible, that means everybody's going to be saved because it, the grace of God that brings salvation is appeared to all men. So that means everybody's saved, right? No, because grace is resistible. Okay. All righty. Um, and grace. Calvinists love to talk about grace. Grace, 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 grace. But they have no clue what grace is. Consider this. Now, I'll tell you a story. And it, it, this exemplifies what Calvinists believe about God's grace. Bill Fencegates, he's a really rich guy, and he's walking down the sidewalk, and he happens to see three people sitting on a curb. They're emaciated. They're weak. They are dirty. They're clothed in rags. So... Fence Gates sees them. He goes into a store where the, next to where they are. He buys one banana. He buys one carton of milk. And he buys one sandwich. And he walks out the store and he gives it to one of the three men. And he says, this is for you only. It's not for these other guys. Now, another guy has been watching all this. A bystander, a bystander watches all this and he asks him, why did you buy the food for one of them and not all of them? And then Fence Gates replies, I provided the food to one of them to show how gracious I am. Now, the bystanders just can't believe it. He laughs, and he walks in the store, 
and he buys food for the other two guys and he comes out and he gives them the food because he's really gracious. Because you see, if you're really gracious, that's innate, that's inside you. It doesn't depend, it's not, it doesn't matter who the person is, it doesn't matter who the recipient is. Grace is a characteristic that's internal and it works itself out. And God is gracious. And that means he's gracious to everybody. Now, they like to say, well, yeah, God's gracious to everybody in some ways because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Yeah, right. But the true need of man is the grace of God that brings salvation, the grace of God that gives him forgiveness of sins and gives him everlasting life. You know, it's not, hey, rain is good. We love it. We want it. We don't want droughts. But hey, I'd much rather have the grace of God that saves my soul and die because drought kill me by thirst or by lack of food or whatever. I want God's grace that saves my soul. Thank God God is truly gracious. Not like this mischaracterization or this, you know, this non-grace grace that Calvinism believes in. It's yeah. totally different. Totally different. Um, now, I, I had a, on, these, on these missions boards, I posted that same kind of story. And a Calvinist said, the question is not why a why wasn't food provided to all of them? The question is, why was food even provided to one of them? Now, see, that shows they have no concept of what grace is. It's obvious why, why God helps people and gives them what they need, because he's gracious. To, to, say, to say the question is, it's not that why doesn't God say, save anybody? Why does he save the elect? Yeah, that just totally shows that they have no clue what they're talking about. Then finally, perseverance of the saints. Now, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints recognizes, this is what they say, that true Christians will always persevere and are eternally secure because God keeps them that way. But yet, the name of the doctrine is perseverance of the saints. They needed a P. Why didn't they use power of God? It kept by the power of God. Why didn't they use preserve blameless in Jesus Christ? Why didn't they put the focus on God and what God does instead of the saints and what the saints do? And that's not, that's fishy. So, now, they do, you know, historically they've said, and they say, even now they say they believe in once saved, always saved. But it gets, it gets a little, it gets a little funny. Because, um, get, get, John, get First John chapter 3. It gets a little funny. Because there's this thing called lordship, lordship salvation in Calvinism. And they say they believe once saved, always saved. But there's this guy, and I don't know him. I don't know what he preached or what he taught. But his name, is, his name was Rabbi Zacharias, and maybe many of you have heard of him, but I really don't know any, anything about him, so I'm ignorant of him. And there was a discussion, there was a YouTube video, and when these Calvinists got together and they talked about this guy, evidently he's a preacher of some sort, a leader of some Christian movement of some sort, I don't know exactly what it is. But the, the issue was, where is Ra Rabbi Zacharias now? Because it came to light he was involved in some immorality, serious immorality that had occurred for an ongoing period of time. And so the question among these Calvinists was, where is Rabbi Zacharias now? And so I entered into that discussion and I said, I don't know anything about the guy, but if he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of souls, if that's what he believed, then he saved. The issue was never, did. Did Rabbi Zacharias trust Jesus Christ as his savior? That was never the question. The issue was that he was involved in this sin and he continued in it and he never repented of it and died. So the whole issue is where is he? Could he how could he be in heaven because he committed these sins and he never repented? And of course Calvinists think that repentance means that you stop sinning. And if that's the definition of repentance, then no one has ever repented. Amen. Because no one's ever stopped sinning. And as a matter of fact, that makes God a sinner. Because multiple times in the Bible, the Bible says God repents. You remember when Moses was up on the mount, and Aaron made the golden calves? And 
God was going to destroy the people, but Moses intervened, talked him out of it. The Bible says he repented of the evil that he was going to do to those people because they were worshiping those golden calves. So repentance doesn't mean to stop sinning. Repentance means to turn, to turn towards God. So what they've done is they have changed their Bibles. You've got 1 John chapter 3. The Bible says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. They've changed the Bible, and they say, Whosoever, whosoever is born of God did not practice sin and cannot continue in sin. So they've changed the Bible to buttress their beliefs. And Arminians like that too. So really what you have is Calvinists, Arminians, both put believers into hell. They just go about it differently. The Calvinists say the man who ends up, the, the believer, quote unquote, who ends up in hell was never saved to begin with because he continued in his sin. The Arminian says, well, he was saved, but he lost it because he continued practicing sin. So they both end up putting believers into hell. So even the, even the one that's closest to a proper doctrine, uh, they've got issues and problems with that. And uh, I mean, we know that, that's, we, know that uh, we know that that doctrine isn't true. You remember Ananias and Sapphira, they sinned against God at that point, the way God was dealing with them, he just dropped them dead. He didn't really give them a chance to repent. Um, you remember also in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with the man who was having a relationship, a relations with his father's wife, with his stepmother. Paul says to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved. He didn't repent. Paul said, hey, deliver him to Satan. God will deal with him. God will take him out. Of course, the man, the man ends up, he repents. And so, you know, praise the Lord for that. But the fact of the matter is that our perseverance doesn't do anything as far as saving us or keeping us saved. It's God's power that keeps us saved. So we basically looked at the argument that Calvinists put forth when they were challenged for their doctrines and their beliefs that, uh, that, uh, ac that uh, tulip, that flower. And we find out God didn't make that flower. That's an artificial flower. Yeah. And, uh, and all, the, all the petals fall off of it when you expose it to the Bible. Right. So, well, there you go. So I hope that's a help. I'm just glad that the, the, the true and living God is the God of the Bible. Amen. He's not the God of a man-made system who distorts him, mischaracterizes him, changes his nature, Totally, you know, totally corrupts God's nature. That's, what, that's really what happens when, when men get involved in trying to reinvent God. Uh, but thank the Lord we've got his Bible. We believe it, and it helps us. And when we think about God and who he really is and how he deals with sinners, what a blessing that is. What God, God has done everything to offer sinners salvation. But see, here's something else Calvinists don't understand. They don't understand what love is. Because love is a relationship, a, a, a relationship based on love between two parties. They both have to agree to the terms of the relationship. If they don't, one can love the other, but there's no relationship there based on love. What Calvinists want to do is make people robotic. And they're not, they don't have any choice about whether they love God or not. God, God makes them love him. That's not love. But what God wants is a relationship with, with any person based on love. And if a person wants to do that, then God has made a way for that to happen. But God has a say in the matter as well. You know, there are lots of people who say, I can worship God any way I choose. No, you can't. You can't deal with any hu other human being that way. How do you think you're going to deal with God that way? You can't do it. You have to deal with God and have a relationship with God in a way that God accepts. But God says, for if it's going to be love, you have to accept the way that I offer. And of course, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And the way that you can have that loving relationship with God is through Jesus Christ, and there's no other way. But that's the truth, and so I'm thankful that God's word portrays him as who he is.
and we can understand who he is and we can see how great and how loving and how gracious he is. So I'm thankful for that. So praise the Lord. Lord, we sure do thank you for who you are. And um, Lord, you said there's heresies, there are heresies among us uh, to, to, to show them uh, which are approved. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us our word and that we can study. Uh, to show ourselves approved and that we can take these things and we can, uh, these ideas and these teachings and these doctrines and we can compare them to the Bible and we see that the, uh, the doctrines that men invent, Lord, they just fall so short. And Lord, we are glad that you have revealed yourself to us through your word and we're thankful that you're such a great and merciful God. And we thank you for your Bible, and we thank you for this time together. And Lord, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.